In this video, let's do an introduction to some basic lighting concepts and rendering. Now I've already gone ahead and I set up a 3D sphere using the presets provided in Photoshop. And then to make the shadows a little easier to see, I went ahead and just made a blank layer underneath my 3D object and filled it blue. Now the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to change the angle on my sphere just a little bit. Uh, it, granted, it's, it's a sphere, so it kind of looks the same from every angle, but just to um, orbit the ground plane a little bit and point out something that I probably should have mentioned a couple of videos ago. I'm going to go up to my options bar and I'm going to use my 3D navigation tools to move my view around. So I'm going to click on my 3D layer, boom, and when I go up to my option bar, it's missing those tools to move around my 3D object and move around my view. If you're not seeing the tools up here, what you need to do is go to your move tool. Right now I'm on my paintbrush tool. Once I click on my move tool, it brings up those 3D buttons. And then once that happens, you see your 3D space comes to life again. You get your grid and all the stuff that you are accustomed to seeing. So I apologize earlier for not mentioning that. I just, by default, my move tool is just always on. So I didn't sort of bump into that, that little speed bump there. But if you're not seeing your 3D tools up here, just go ahead and click on your move tool and everything should, should come to life. So I'm just going to spin my angle a little bit here. Not that I really have to, but I really just wanted to demonstrate the fact that my move tool wasn't active and I couldn't get to those tools to begin with. So let's, let's move on. I'm going to go ahead, I'm going to click on my 3D tab here. And by default, you will get one infinite light in your scene. You have to have at least one light in your scene or else everything renders out black. You need light for anything to be visible. When I click on my infinite light, you'll get this widget on the screen. And this controls the direction of your light. It's kind of like this half globe. It almost kind of looks like a cross section of the earth with the core in the middle or something like that. But if you take that globe and spin it around, you can see I'm orbiting my light around my object. You can kind of grab it from the handle up here, or sometimes people grab it by, by the shadow and navigate it that way. You know, you can just click and drag like you normally do and make that light spin around. And you'll notice the light source is changing its direction. Now the light is hitting the right-hand side of the sphere, and of course it will throw a shadow to the left-hand side. And if I spin it over here, it now hits the left-hand side of the sphere and throws a shadow to the right. So the shadows directly relate to the direction that the light is coming from, as they should. Now let's take a look at a couple of lighting options. If I go up here to my properties, uh, you'll see it's set to infinite light. You have your infinite light properties right here. If you click on the little cube icon, you'll get the coordinates just like you do with objects. So you can go ahead, if things get really out of control, you can reset the coordinates and put it back to its default location. I'm going to go ahead, let's go to the different properties we have here. One nice little property that, that's pretty straightforward is color and intensity. Well, intensity is how bright the light's going to be. By default, it's usually on 90%. If I bring it down, you'll see the light gets darker. If I bring it up, the light gets much more intense. And you can bring the intensity up pretty high. It goes well beyond 100. I think the slider goes all the way up to about 1,000, which is pretty crazy. I'm going to put it back down to, uh, you know, to, to 90, just, just at its default setting at the moment. You can also change the color of the light simply by hitting the color swatch here. And you can go ahead and essentially gel the light. You know, if you want to have a, a warmer sort of morning sun type of effect, you can warm up the temperature of the light a little bit. If you want to make it look like it was shot at nighttime, you can give it a little hint of blue. It sort of has that nighttime moonlight feel to it. I'm going to go ahead and just going to keep it a little warm at the moment. Now you want to be careful when you're changing the color. I mean, changing the color changes the color. But up here are some other intensity sliders. These will open the light uh, in essentially like photographic stops. You know, like you're changing the stop on your camera, lighting in or cutting in the amount of light coming to the camera. So you can also ramp up the intensity of the light as well, or you can pull it down. And that functions independently of the intensity slider up here. So you might accidentally, and I've done this a couple of times myself, so let, me, let me zero this out. Sometimes I come up here and I click a color hue that's up here, and that's not really changing the color as much as it's changing the intensity. So if you're just looking to change the color, stick to the color picker down here. If you play with this slider or the swatches up here, that actually changes the intensity of the light as well. And there's really nothing wrong with that. 
you just want to make sure that it functions independently of the intensity up here. So now the sphere looks like it's very intense, even though my intensity is only at 90. It just doesn't seem to add up. But if I click on the color, I can see I've got the intensity ramped up over here. So I'm just going to zero that out. So just be cautious when you're in here picking color that you don't accidentally or inadvertently adjust the intensity and not realize you did so. So I'm just going to take the color. I'm going to leave it. Well, that's, that's kind of a muddy color. Let's get a little little warmer there. There we go. And now I've got the light hitting the sphere and it's throwing a shadow. Speaking of shadows, there's a checkbox here for shadows. Every light that you put in the scene has an option for changing the color and changing the shadows. If I uncheck the shadows, the shadow casting goes away. That light does not cast any, or I should say the, the it's not that the light doesn't cast the shadow, but the light hits the object and then the object casts the shadow. If you shut that off, that light, any objects uh, getting affected by that light will not cast shadows. A really nice adjustment to shadows is their softness. If I drag this slider up, I can give it a nice soft shadow. So if you take a look at my shadow at the moment, the softness is at zero. If I drag up my slider to say maybe around 50, the shadow gets softer. And it's a fairly realistic softness to the shadow. Shadows shouldn't have the same softness in a uniform manner. They should start a little uh, more hard edge where they're near the object, and as the shadow gets further away from the object, they should get a little softer. Now, <clears throat> I'm looking at this, and I've adjusted my shadow softness, and it's kind of hard to tell. I don't know if it's really going to come across in the video, but the shadow is going to look a little uh, banded. It's going to look a little maybe low res. As a matter of fact, even my object is not anti-aliased. It's got these little jaggy edges around the side and I'm seeing my 3D interface. The one thing we haven't talked about yet, and now's a good time to introduce it, is we've been playing around with our objects. We moved them in 3D space. We played around with wireframes and cross sections, but those were just uh, approximate quick renders of what the object should look like. If you really want to see what the final output is going to be, you need to start rendering. And this is something that you do quite often uh, as you're tweaking lights and doing things with objects. Every once in a while you want to do a render and see what it looks like. A render takes all the information you've put into Photoshop, so the lights, the cross-section information, the shadow information, and actually generates a much cleaner uh, version of that 3D object. The render button is located at the bottom of the properties panel. It's this little 3D box inside of a box. And when you click on it, Photoshop will start rendering out the final image. Now, once you click on it, this is what's going to happen in the scene. You're going to get this sort of dithering going on. You most likely cannot do anything else in Photoshop. You'll get your cursor will turn into the little busy, swirly gray thing. And Photoshop is now going to start generating the final look of this image. And you can see it's really grainy at the moment. That's going to, over time, start to dither out and it's going to get smoother and smoother. Now, it might take a moment before it kicks in. It just popped on my screen right now. At the bottom, in the lower left-hand uh, part of the interface of Photoshop, you'll see a time remaining indicator. And for me to render out this sphere with a soft shadow and this kind of warm light to it is going to take about four and a half minutes. It actually started at about five and by the time I brought your attention to it about 20 seconds had gone by. So you can see this takes about you know four to five minutes to generate the final image. So the rendering can be very time consuming. This is not a complex scene. There's no complex lighting going on. The more processing power your computer has not so much RAM, but processing power. The, fa the more processes you have in your computer, the more cores you have, the faster the rendering is going to go. And basically, you just wait here. You wait for it to finish rendering. Now, if you're in the middle of a render and the image is starting to look a little cleaner and then you start to notice stuff that isn't right, you can hit your escape key, get out of the render or abort the render, go ahead and fix things. But what's nice is if I hit the escape key by accident and realize, well, there was nothing I wanted to fix, I can hit the render button again and Photoshop will continue the render from where it left off. So instead of taking five minutes, it now takes about three and a half because that's roughly where it left off. If I hit escape and change my angle of view, let's just rotate, oops, rotate the scene just a little bit and hit render, well, now it's going to pretty much start over from scratch because I've changed the orientation of 
of everything on the screen, so it's gonna start over again. Now, if I look in my lower left-hand corner, let's bring my cursor down there. My cursor's thinking, well, my cursor's not thinking, but Photoshop's thinking, and I'm not seeing that time uh, left to elapse for the render just yet. It takes a moment for it to come up. It's like Photoshop has to do all these pre-calculations, and eventually it figures out the time remaining, give or take, and now it just popped up, and it's back to about, you know, it's about five and a half minutes. Now for the sake of time, we're just going to skip ahead to the final product, much like they do on, you know, baking shows on TV. They mix the ingredients and then two minutes later, poof, it comes out of the oven, all nice and ready to eat. So we're just going to jump ahead and see what this final render looks like. And poof, like magic, it's done, and here is our final render. Now at the moment, I'm still seeing my 3D environment, like my grids and stuff. If I go to my layers palette and simply click off of, my 3D layer onto my background, it goes away. And you can see now, I've got, you know, nice soft dithered shadows, anti-alias sphere, it's looking pretty good. Now the moment I move it around, I'm gonna have to re-render it again. It's gonna be another, whatever time it took, another five minutes or so. Now would be a good time to point out, if you like the rendering, and you wanna commit to it, Anytime you click and modify any little thing on this 3D layer, it's going to have to render again. So if you're really happy with where it's at, you can right click on the layer and set it to rasterize 3D. And that will convert this 3D object into just a generic layer. If I click on that, it just becomes a regular old layer. I can do whatever you would normally do to a layer. You can paint on it, edit it, so forth and so on. However, it's no longer 3D, so I can't edit the object. One thing I would recommend doing, oops, let's uh, undo that there, is duplicating the layer first, hiding a copy, and then rasterizing it. And that way, if you ever have to go back and edit the 3D part of the layer, you've got a backup copy in place. Again, the rasterizing is a very destructive process. So I'm going to take this layer that I rasterized, I'm going to throw it in the trash, I'm going to go back to my sphere, turn it back on, because I want to talk a little more about lighting. I'm going to click on my 3D layer, click on my infinite light, there it is. We spin it around, there's our shadow. Now one thing you can do is you can add a second infinite light. Actually, there's, there's three types of light, infinite, spot, and point. We're going to focus on infinite. So you go down here to the bottom of your 3D layers uh, palette, you click on the light bulb, and you go new infinite light. It'll pop it right up, kind of like directly in view here. Your object will most likely get very, very bright because now it's getting uh, impacted by two light sources. I'm going to go ahead, I'm going to roll this light off to this side, kind of more toward the back and maybe up a little more. And I'm going to take that light color and I'm going to just mix it with a little bit of... Um, you know, let's just do, I'll do a little bit of blue in there. Let's see. Oh, I do have blue in my background. Hmm, let's do a little green. It's probably gonna be kind of an icky color. That's, I'll go with it for the sake of the demo. It's kind of an icky color combination, but we'll, we'll go with it. Um, same deal, I can control the intensity of the light and I can, I'm gonna leave it at about 100 or 90, somewhere in between there. And I can also mess with the softness of the shadow as well. And I was going to roll this light a little more, and you can sort of see the green tint hitting off the back here, and that warmer tint hitting off the front of the sphere. You know what I think I'm going to do? Let me go back to that first infinite light. And you can rename these lights, just like you rename lights. Just double click, and I'm going to call this, this will be kind of like my key light, and the other one will be my backlight, so I don't get confused. My key light, let's go ahead and change it from that sort of warm tone. Let's go ahead, you know, we'll just make it red so it really stands out quite a bit, just to, so you can obviously see what's going on here with the lights. I'm going to take my backlight, the shadow is on a softness of 55, the key light is on a softness of 49. They're pretty close, there's not a big difference between a couple of percent here, but I'll just, I'll just match them up. I'll put them both at 50. 50 for the key, 50 for the back. And again, just to show what this looks like, let's go hit the render button, which is located at the bottom of the properties palette. And again, this will take another, there's two light sources. The more light you put in, the little longer the render takes each time. So we'll let this process. And you can already see the two shadows coming into play from each light. And you can definitely see the red tint from the key light and then the green tint from the backlight. 
I love gelling the lights. I think it gives the objects just a little more depth. Now these I've really exaggerate the color of the gel. Sometimes I'm really, really subtle with it. Okay, let's just let this render out and uh, it looks like it's telling me it's about six and a half minutes. So adding that second light added another minute to my render time. Now of course your render times will vary uh, once again depending on the object and the processing power. So let's just fast forward in time once again and poof through the magic of editing here is our final result with the light sources on the sphere now there's other lights you can play around with and we'll kind of keep this short here let me go back to my 3d layers here i've been playing around with these infinite lights which i think are the easiest to control you can also add in things like spotlights i'm going to shut off the two infinite lights i made and now I've got, oh, that's a point light. I didn't want that, I want a spotlight. Sorry about that. You can uh, delete items from your 3D environment just by dragging them to the trash can at the bottom of the palette window there. And let's go ahead, let's put a spotlight in. Spotlights are more like theatrical lights, uh, like a floodlight. They're a little trickier to move around. If I go up to the properties, usually I do move to view, that will get it in front of the object. And then point at origin will make the light point at the object. So I usually start by just hitting these two buttons. And then you can go ahead and rotate the light like you do anything else. It is a little, I will say, they're a little tricky to control where they're hitting. But the spotlights are more like a theatrical light or even kind of like a flashlight. As I roll it around it, the cone angle of it hits parts of the object. It does have a couple more options unlike the linear light. You get color and you get the shadow uh, softness control just like you do with the linear light but you also get the hot spot that's how focused the light is and you get the cone angle that will bring the cone angle down spotlight a little more so you can control it kind of like a floodlight you can open up the cone angle and you can close down the cone angle so it just illuminates a little part of the object spotlights are a little tricky to control inside of Photoshop you can play around with them. I'm going to kind of end it here. I would start off with those linear lights. They're a lot easier to, to get going in the direction that you want. But then when you're feeling pretty comfortable and you want to be a little bolder, you can go ahead and play with the spotlights. Uh, so that's just a real basic introduction to lighting. And I think that's good enough. As long as you can control the intensities and you can control the colors, uh, you can get some reasonably good... Oh, and the shadows. Don't forget the shadows. The ability to control the softness of the shadows is, is pretty handy. So that should get you up and running. It gives you enough to play around with.